Good evening. We are live. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Uh, I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. I will do a roll call of council members. Councillor Wright. Good evening. Councillor Knack. Good evening. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good evening. Councillor Paquette. Good evening. Councillor Tang. Good evening. Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador. Good evening. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Rice. Good evening. And Councillor Jans. Good evening. Good. We have quorum. Adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I'll move the adoption of the agenda uh, for today's meeting. Thank you. Need a second. Second. Councillor Rice seconded it. Uh, please vote. Councillor Salvador is yes. Councillor Wright is yes. Thank you. I may yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Jans is yes. Thank you. Yes for me. It's not showing up. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette, is it showing up for you? We just don't have your It's vote. not, so okay. I may yes. Okay. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? Seeing none, select items for debate. We all, all need to be selected, so can someone select all? Councillor Rice, you want to do that? Uh, sure. I can select from 5.1 to 5.6. Okay. Second. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, selections don't need to be seconded. Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, there's nothing to vote on uh, the items select, not selected for debate. A request to speak, none. A request for specific time on agenda, none. Vote on bylaws not select for debate, none. Report to be dealt with a different meeting, none. Request to reschedule the reports, none. Public reports. We are going to go to our first item on the agenda, which is the Edmonton Design Committee 2022 Annual Report and 2023 Work Plan. And we have with us, joining virtually, Chair of the EDC, Janice Mills. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss and review the EDC committee annual report and our work plan and budget. Uh, my name is Janice Mills and I'm the current chair of EDC. 
The Edmonton Design Committee mandate is to improve the quality of urban design in the city of Edmonton. The committee operates under bylaw 19784 when we accept submissions and provide recommendations to urban planning on development permit applications and rezoning applications within the established EDC boundary. We also include large site infills, large transit oriented developments, regardless of their location and other projects as requested by council or the city manager. Uh, in addition to our bylaw, the work of the committee is also guided by our new EDC standards and procedures, which were developed through a collaboration of uh, the committee through work of a multi-year subcommittee uh, and also city administration. The committee would like to highlight and acknowledge the efforts of city administration, specifically Peter Speary and Wes Sims. Uh, the standard and procedures that uh, provides clear direction to the day-to-day -day functions of EDC and clearly defines the roles and responsibilities of administration, the committee members, and the applicants. As such, the standards and procedures now align the committee with other city policies and bylaws. The EDC's principles of urban design expresses and guides the aspirations of the committee and facilitates a meaningful conversation with applicants to support exemplary urban design in Edmonton. The three overarching pr principles relates to urbanism, design excellence, and scale, connection, and context. Um, as you would see in our appendix, uh, the ur principles of urban design was identified as a key concern uh, from the development industry and is one of our current work plan items for 2023-2024. Uh, the committee continues to interact with applicants in two ways, through formal submissions and informal submissions. To align with our new standards and procedures, formal submissions are posted to the website for public viewing and committee review 10 days prior to the meeting. And formal submissions also provide the opportunity for approved public speakers. And uh, the committee also now deliberates in public. Uh, to allow for improved accessibility and transparency, our meetings, uh, excluding the informal presentation portions, are live streamed to the EDC YouTube channel for public viewing. Uh, in the opinion of the committee, informal pre-consultations still remain extremely valuable, uh, and it gives us a better opportunity to prepare applicants for the formal submissions. Uh, membership, the EDC consists of up to 12 uh, members appointed by city councils, uh, with various design professions like AAA, APEGA, ALA, uh, APPI. Uh, the committee also has five public me members, um, which includes uh, representatives from the development industry, a representative from the post-secondary institute, and a member at large. Um, the average length of our meetings is three hours. Uh, we typically meet for two meetings per month on the first and thurs third Tuesday. Uh, the committee is currently still operating under a hybrid scenario with in-person and virtual attendance possible. During the 2022-2023 term, we received and reviewed 22 formal submissions, which was down from the previous 35 in the previous term. 18% or 18 of those um, received a motion of support and four received a motion of non-support. Uh, the committee also received and reviewed eight informal pre-consultations. Um, our 2023-2024 work plan has four main objectives in addition to our regular EDC duties. Uh, these objectives will be the work of the subcommittee, um, which currently has already started and with the inclusion of uh, our new EDC members that will be joining in May, uh, we will also see if there is any uh, people that would like to join the subcommittee. Uh, the four main items that we would like to do is improve onboarding and training tools for new members. Uh, our first session is tentatively scheduled for May 2nd with our new members that will be onboarded. We also are looking to review the EDC principles of 
urban design as noted earlier. We are looking at doing uh, industry engagement for a dual purpose, one to evaluate the effectiveness of our new EDC standards and procedures, at the same time reviewing the EDC principles of urban design. Uh, and lastly, we are looking to host a counselor luncheon, uh, which has not occurred since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the purpose of this luncheon was twofold. It provides an informal setting um, for the EDC members and mayor and city councillors uh, to just learn more about the work of the committee and at the same time recognize uh, our past previous outgoing members. Um, and that is all I have. Thank you so much for your presentation and uh, as well as uh, your commitment to uh, to the committee and uh, excellent and beautiful design and uh, architecture that you promote. So please do that uh, convey our appreciation to uh, all the all the members as well, right? Uh, thank you, Janice. And we have questions from council members uh, and I'll go to Councillor Tang first. Great, thank you so much, Janice, for that update. Um, I'm very interested in your subcommittee policy work and re uh, the policy review alignment work. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just noting, uh, you know, out of many principles and, and guidelines, uh, one thing that's very top of mind for me is certainly, um, you know, the city's uh, key priorities, including uh, climate resilience. And I'm wondering how, how much of that um, alignment the EDC is looking at when it comes to the city's climate resilience policy. So right this second, we haven't delved into, we've actually only had a couple of meetings with the subcommittee and our focus had been on onboarding. So we haven't delved into the details, uh, but that would be one of the areas that we would be looking at uh, just reviewing. So we have alignment similar with any of the other city policies or guidelines regarding things like accessibility um, and uh, the, those type of things. So it, it can be included on the committee's work and hopefully we can provide an update at next year's annual report. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm also curious, you know, over the past, um, you know, several years I that, certain, you know, for example, you've been involved, have you seen uh, conversations around uh, climate resilience as part of design come up more frequently? I, I would definitely say so, especially with revisions to code over the past five years of myself being on the committee. Uh, the new energy code and the alignment that's bringing to developments has definitely brought some of those conversations to the forefront. I would also say that a lot of developers um, are looking at climate resiliency and also green practices, so things like um, solar panels, um, you know, anything like that. LEED certification is a really big one as, as well as well certification. Um, so I think as a whole, the development industry has moved more towards that. Mm -hmm. And then I guess just, you know, thinking about the committee itself um, kind of moving forward, do you feel, uh, you know, uh, do you feel, cur you know, currently there is that expertise to kind of look at this area or, you know, is that a need down the road? So it, it was actually one of the considerations that we looked at, though it wasn't a posted consideration for the architectural um, position members. We actually looked, um, the vice chair and I, when we were going through applicants in regards to lead um, certification. So um, just trying to keep that in the for, for front of our, our mind. So like I said, it's not a mandatory requirement when we've been doing our recruitment, but it is something that we have been considering um, when we've been evaluating. That's that's great to hear that, that you're thinking about that and that's very top of mind for you. Um, of course, you know, I think there's other ways perhaps that 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 alignment can can be found. Uh, I know my colleague here has some questions, uh, so I will just wait and listen. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's very comprehensive. Okay, thank you, Councillor Tang. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just to follow up on Councillor Tang's questions, um, I had very similar ones. I, I guess I'm also wondering, um, 
you know, cross-pollination and collaboration with other committees. I know we have um, ETCRC, the Energy Transition and Resilience Committee of Council, um, and, and they're doing some, some really excellent work as well. And um, of course, recognizing that, that buildings, um, energy efficiency, climate-friendly design uh, is a big part of becoming a more climate-resilient city. Um, is, there, is there opportunities or has there been any conversations about um, potentially having a chat with ETCRC to see uh, where you folks might be able to, um, to support one another? Yeah, I can say that we haven't had any of those conversations to date, but um, I do think that's a really good suggestion, especially with the subcommittee work that's uh, that's currently going on. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'd be very, very excited to to see what conversations and um, and ideas and paths forward come out of that. Um, but no, Councillor Councillor Tang covered uh, the rest, so thank you so much for the comprehensive answers. Thank you, Councillor. Salvador and uh, Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? I've got the chair. Thank you. I just have one question. Out of curiosity, uh, uh, I noticed that during the 2022-2023 term, EDC reviewed 22 formal submissions compared to 35 in the previous term, right? Uh, uh, anything to read, in, uh, read into that or just uh, fewer application coming your way? I, I think a lot of it had to do with just the the development industry as a whole. Um, I know from my my employer where I work, there was definitely a decrease in uh, projects going into design during that phase. Um, I would say statistic wise right now, uh, we have picked up a little bit, uh, but I do think it will be a, a slower start coming out of the pandemic. Um, with that. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, related to that uh, is just now we have the design committee in place. There's no high standards uh, in the area, in the geographical areas where you are responsible for reviewing the applications. Are you seeing overall kind of uh, uh, voluntary uh, uh, desire on part of developers to up their game on uh, on architectural standards in other areas. I I would say yes. Um, it, it's one of those things. I always say that the work of the committee is kind of unseen for the fact that some of the projects that we see come in, um, you know, they take our comments and they run with them. So. Uh, the improvements are already in the built world when they get there. Mm. Um, I would say that um, informal, like I said, informal consultations, we do find really valuable because it allows for really open communication with applicants. Um, mm. We definitely try and encourage all applicants to come for an informal um, and, and we'll continue to do that in the future. Yeah, great. No, thank you so much for your work. Uh, Councillor Rice has some questions as well. Councillor Rice, uh, I'll take oh, the chair back. Chair. And Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I just want to start to say thank you, Janice, and uh, for the presentation. And I really appreciate the professional committee and doing those type of professional work and to support our city's decision on urban design. Uh, I do have a follow-up questions, and specifically regarding the formal uh, submissions and in your report that mentioned about um, development related to development permits and also related to rezoning applications. So my question is, is all those review and from the committee happened before those application um, come to city council to make final decision? So it seems like this, it's a first get, I don't know if there's proper words to use, a first get, get, and for the applications to go through and design committee. Is that understanding correct? Uh, yes, so we've tried to realign our process um, so that the committee receives packages uh, after they have been submitted for development permit. 
Um, part of that is to give the development officers an opportunity to review the drawings and provide comment and feedback, um, as well as our, our urban design comments on them. Um, but yes, you are correct. Okay, so why am I asking this question specifically? I want ask during this process and specifically if you look at 2021 the new etc standards does that the factor and one of the factor to impact our development permit issue time uh because right now and then uh public perceive we take longer time to issue the development permit is those review process uh, is a part of that timeline or is outside that scope? It's it's outside of that scope. Wonderful. I want to get that clarification. So that means ETC's review will not be in that timeline scope to impact the how long the time window for city to issue that development permit. No, typically our process is running concurrently with internal circulation. So is internal circulation with state administration and that um, recommendation provides to state administration support or non-support that will come to the council? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification. Uh, my next question is related to the budget. So specific for the budget, uh, <clears throat> look at the difference between the actuals and the budget itself. Um, you probably can say it's a huge difference. Uh, I, I read the notes why we have those difference. And specifically for first item, honorary, that item, and how many vacancies and we had in 2022 that compared to the actually ha happened and to the budget? Because if you look at the huge difference is almost like si close to 60,000 difference, $6,000 difference. Yes, so we we had three to four vacancies over the course of the term. Um, one was partway through uh, the term. That's why I, I say three to four. Um, and I, I would also say prior to COVID, our, when our meetings were held uh, entirely in person, the meetings were... Um, I don't want to say significantly longer, but they were longer in duration than what our uh, virtual meetings have typically been. Um, so, of course, when putting together the 2022 budget, uh, not knowing when we were going to transition back to either in-person meetings or a hybrid, um, we carried kind of a, a a mixture between what we were anticipating if we went back to full in-person meetings with full committee attendance um, for the maximum duration, which is what we tried to summarize in our, our notes there. But we, we don't have the challenge, so we are not, we did not face the challenge in 2022 and for our uh, members, committee members to attend in the meetings and to contribute to their expertise, right? So no, I know my time we have very good attendance. I, I okay. don't think attendance was the main driver. It was um, due to not having a full committee um, member on board. Like okay. we we're missing an architect. Uh, okay. We we're missing an APEGA member, et cetera. So. Okay, thank you very much. My time is out. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I'm just also wondering, would it also be dependent on the, the reduced number of applications that re you received from the 35 to the 22? It, yes, it, it, that, that does impact it, um, but not as great as what you would think. Uh, the majority, I don't think we put in the number of meetings that we canceled, but we typically don't cancel that many meetings. Um, the meetings may only have one applicant instead of four applicants in them 
Um, so typically the $100 base honorarium um, is usually paid. Okay. Okay. I was just wondering if there was some correlation there. Okay. That's all. Yeah. I, I do think it, it's also important to note that our main subcommittee uh, work was completed kind of at the very start of the 2022 term. Um, so we didn't also have a lot of subcommittee work going on during the duration of the 2022 to 2023 term, um, which is now going to start to ramp back up as we, we approach our, our new initiatives with uh, Principal Suburban Design Review. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you so much, Janice. Really appreciate your leadership and the work that committee is doing. Keep it up and wish you all the best. That, conclude, that concludes all the questions from council members. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Uh, are we kind of making the accepting the recommendations I'm trying as to we remember go what we did last week i, I think, think that i think we i think, I think we waited till all the no i think you did it as the as um, we went as we went through the items yes okay do we have a council representative on edc Ad Ad advent and design committee we do that's me Councilor Piccari, you want to move it sure yeah so moved okay thank Second. you Councilor rice seconded that all right please vote We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Carrying on Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. And we have with us co-chairs of ETCRC, Maya Koligru and Jacob Kumar and they are both attending virtually and i see Yay. i see both of you on this uh, i see you maya on the screen but i don't see yeah it's mo it's mostly me jacob is support so i'll be leading this one and uh he may jump in if he can he's just not able to be here fully <laughs> no problem over to you then go ahead okay great uh so thanks for having us of course we're gonna just get right into it um, of course, as we often like to say in our committee, all decisions are climate decisions. Uh, while we've seen some impressive success in pushing towards an Edmonton that is both adaptive to climate change and mitigates its own impacts, uh, there's still quite an urgent need to keep pushing strongly towards our goal of achieving a net zero city by 2050. The science is clear. You know it. I know it. I'm still going to say it. The climate is warming faster than predicted. We have less time and fewer available adaptation strategies uh, present before us. We are gaining traction. We feel good about that, but we do also feel and know that the real work is still ahead of us and the ETCRC is here to help. So 2022 to 2023 has been quite eventful and productive for us. Um, we've continuously engaged in important work that helps bring the city of Edmonton closer to its climate goals. A short, non-exhaustive list of our activities include, um, one, providing ongoing support in developing the carbon budget, two, meeting with different city departments to ensure attention is paid to climate action at all levels, and three, advocating for a fiscal budget that reflects our climate goals. So just a little bit of background on, um, on ETCRC. Uh, we do have 14 members in total. Uh, we lost four of them in the last changeover, but we're really eager, eager to welcome the four new ones at our next meeting, which is taking place in a few weeks. Uh, our overall expenses last year was basically entirely honorariums and travel expenses. Total of that was fourteen thousand dollars five hundred and sorry fourteen thousand five hundred and twelve dollars, and I don't believe that we foresee any other major expenses outside of these um, in the next year. So we do have seven priorities that we've outlined in our report. Uh, I'm just going to go over them kind of high level here um, because they there are seven of them. So um, the first one, and this is really a big one for us, is culture change. 
we, as we know, we are facing one of the most concerning existential threats of our time, and it's time to start acting like this is an emergency. So what we really want to do is support a culture shift within the city's organization, um, you know, for one that actually is treating this as an emergency. So we've begun meeting with the city manager on this, and there are some plans and very, very early discussions for a climate emergency task force. Uh, and we do hope that this is the beginning of such a, uh, a culture shift. Um, yeah, and we're really excited about that. So again, really early days, but um, that is something that we're hoping to be involved in. Um, we know that this culture shift is also going to depend on council's, le council's leadership, and we really hope that you're also willing to work with us on this. Our second priority is land use, so district planning and zoning bylaw renewal. Uh, we want to make sure that district and zoning changes are transformative and align with the city's transition goals. It's so essential that we get this right while we have the opportunity to do so. And so far, we're really excited of what's coming down the pipeline, uh, but we really do hope to keep supporting momentum uh, in this area and keep pushing us to achieve even greater things. Uh, three is transportation. We need to start tackling uh, some of our largest emission sources. We feel that this is foundational to many aspects of the transition strategy. Four is buildings, uh, again, tackling some of the largest emission sources um, that ties into transportation, land use, and everything in between. Five is energy systems. We need to change how we deliver energy around the city. Six, equity. Uh, and we want to engage all citizens in broad action on climate change. Uh, if it's not equitable, it's not sustainable. And finally, health. Uh, we really want to start addressing the health challenges that climate change poses to the human population from the city level. Um, we feel that this is such a missed opportunity when it comes to how we talk about the climate crisis with the public. Uh, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and we really hope that we can start embedding this type of messaging whenever uh, it's appropriate to do so. So those are the seven priorities and some of the challenges that we believe that we will be facing in the coming year. Um, we really, really need more active support. We feel that some of the items that come before our committee are already done deals. We really can't have much input when we get ideas that far downstream. We don't wanna be a checkbox that people just need to hit before they move forward on projects. So we wanna get in as early as we can and offer strategic support for these decisions that are relevant to our committee. So we really hope that we can, in this way, help the city avoid major pitfalls and mistakes later down the road. Uh, we also, of course, hope to continue uh, working with council towards a net zero Edmonton, and we hope that together we can support this council in becoming the leaders that we need in this warming world. Uh, work with us, let us support you, and let's work together to push for a culture shift that treats the climate emergency uh, as such, like an emergency. So thank you, and happy to take questions. Thank you, Maya. Really appreciate your leadership and the work that you and, uh, and other committee members are leading. Uh, I'll go to council members for questions. All right, here we go, Councilor Tang. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for um, for that presentation and the very thorough, you know, uh, presentation on the work plan. Um, I guess you know, just thinking about the questions I uh, that were asked of the earlier committee, and I'm I'm curious about how much um, interactions. Uh, the ETCRC currently have perhaps with some of the other committees so since there's you know a lot of intersectional work uh, or if not um, do you do you see value in that yes absolutely there is value in this and it's funny we were just talking about this today about what are some potential crossovers I mean you know climate change is an everybody problem and not any one of us can um, solve this on, you know, on our own. Uh, every sector, every level of government is needed. And so I think that we would be extremely open um, to working with other committees and certainly, you know, trying to bring people together uh, to have these really strong um, and cohesive responses. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think this is a, uh, that was certainly a theme even last week with um, some of the other advisory committees. Uh, and uh, I'm glad you were thinking in that direction. And, um, um, you know, I, I mean, I'll just stay here. I, I certainly hope to see that happen and will, you know, do my best to support uh, whatever is needed. Um, I think that's all I have right now. Uh, I mean, I think you guys do really interesting work. Um, when is your, sorry, just, I guess I was just thinking, uh, are you doing an annual luncheon like you did last year too? 
I don't know. I, this is sort of my first year in the role. I don't know. Oh, yeah, Jacob, you got this? No, well, no, I'm just saying okay. we can. We'd love to. We, we want to engage. And I mean, we actually, this was a discussion um, we had a little bit earlier as well. But yeah, absolutely, we'd love to engage, um, especially if a certain topic um, or issue you'd like us to come in to discuss. Absolutely, we'd love to do that. Uh, yes, lunch with council. I mean, I see that you know you have um, on your work plan, for example, presentations around nature-based solutions and uh, some of these like maybe special uh, topic areas. And anyways, I was just I was just curious as it came up, you know, in the last presentation. And um, well, I put it out there. Uh, I think I missed it last year. So <laughs> we, we would we'd be open to that. Yeah. We have some great ideas. We'd love to run past you. So that'd be great. All right, that's all from me. Thank you both, and to the committee for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe the next council member asking questions can facilitate a lunch. Council Salvador. Yeah, I was going to say, let's set it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be a fantastic opportunity just to, I mean, even if it's not on a specific topic, just to sit down with one another. Um, I think that would be yeah, amazing. So happy, happy to take that offline and help with that. Um, and yeah, just in terms of, of questions, uh, the second challenge that that was highlighted um, just around sort of being able to stay on top of all of these moving pieces. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, sort of the support you had in previous years, like first four years of the committee, I think were highlighted versus now and like what, what gap has emerged and how we might be able to um, fill that gap to ensure that the committee has what it needs to uh, work at its best. Yeah, Jacob, I wonder if you want to answer that historical piece. Sure. You know it more. Sure. And um, and and again, the, the intent of this wasn't to throw anyone under the bus. Uh, we we love working with admin. There's so many great people and we know how busy they are. So there we realized that the time challenge that we pose by asking them to prepare us for meetings and all this stuff. But I know that the first four years of the committee, we had a dedicated representative from admin that would um, regularly meet with the chairs, give us context, feedback, um, you know, tell us what items are coming in front of council so that we can be aware of them. Whereas in the last year and a half, two, we, we don't have a representative per se, and we feel like, um, we, we've had to kind of like take it on our own and push our priorities and stuff like that, but we, we're still a volunteer committee and we don't know exactly the inner workings of the city and what things get moved. And so it's, we feel like we've missed some stuff and that's frustrating because we want, especially the big stuff we want to be a part of. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for, for some of the insight there. And um, I think on on our end, obviously, um, we really value the, the input and advice that you have to offer. So making sure you're able to provide that um, by equipping you at the outset with the information you need, I think is just a really critical piece. So um, I'll, I'll likely follow up with that one. Um, and then maybe just just on uh, one of the one of the other priorities. So culture change um, was listed as, as sort of the top one there. And exciting to hear that there might be a climate emergency task force in the works. Um, but wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the culture change piece and and I guess the role that that ETCRC can play in helping push that along. Because um, that's obviously a really big, big conversation. Totally. I think the dream, you know, again, it's like when we say it, we mean it. Every decision is a climate decision, uh, you know, and, and we need to be considering that when we're talking about, you know, building a community or, you know, putting, you know, specific types of housing up and wh whatever it is, you know, however, whatever decisions at whatever level of the city um, that come up to the table, you know, how do we, how do we say, oh, okay, this is a problem I have before me. Here are my considerations and pretty high on that list of considerations is also how are my choices impacting the climate and the environment? So I think, you know, again, it, it's kind of general in that way, but really uh, it, it's basic, right? It's like, we want everyone thinking about this. We want everybody asking that question as they sort of proceed through their day. Um, and, you know, I think how we see ourselves as supporting um, is, you know, it, it's kind of 
open, right? I mean, obviously, this climate um, task force, we would love to kind of help see, um, you know, what kind of work would be necessary or what kind of stuff, you know, um, really, you know, just helping guide the direction of that, I guess, and to see like what is necessary, I guess, you know, first. But I think that we would be open to supporting it in, in, in different ways, right? Whether you want to lean on the experts in our committee, you know, we have quite a, um, a wide array of experts from academics to people in the field making changes. You know, any one of us would be happy to work with departments, um, but also broadly, you know, we can connect people within our networks. Um, you know, all 14 of us together have pretty extensive networks uh, of people mm. who are experts in this field. Um, so, you know, whether it's within the committee or beyond, and um, I think, you know, connecting with the right people, I think, is part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even to your earlier point around um, how we talk about the climate crisis, I think that can have a huge influence on culture as well. And um, bringing different lenses to the table, you mentioned the health lens before. I think that's one that we don't talk about nearly enough um, when we're talking about the why behind climate action. So thanks for, for highlighting that and excellent work. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. And I'll just make one little comment about that health piece. I think that at the city level, we often feel like we can't make decisions up on health because it's not in our purview. But um, again, you know, maybe we can't necessarily deliver health, but we can certainly talk about it. And we can certainly bring that to um, discussions and we can bring that to marketing campaigns and we can go much further than that. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask about the, the health as well, and I think that's kind of does circle back to, to changing the culture. If, you know, more, maybe more people are concerned about their health than they are that consider there to be a climate crisis. Totally. And I remember when I went to this presentation once, and um, it was given by a doctor, and he said, you know what? People don't care about polar bears, y'all. Sorry. It's just apparently it's not working. Um, but what they do care about is their own health and the health of their children and the air quality that they're breathing when they go on walks with their babies uh, and things like that. So, you know, um, it's really, you know, how do we harness the power of that health message and um, really help people realize that there is this problem that is actually impacting you today in your life, whether you realize it or not. And, and how do you think, I mean, in your report, you talk about um, for the city to focus on communicating those health benefits. Um, is there any sort of suggestions or recommendations you could make to them there, on how to communicate? I mean, as a little bit of background context, I am a nurse. So, yes, lots. Um, but I'll give you just one, which I think is super obvious, but, you know, idling your car. The air quality, uh, you know, when you idle in, near school or anywhere, you know, um, this stuff is, it, you know, we know this. This is old news. And I think that it's even, um, you know, there are bylaws around idling, but I don't think that they're enforced. Um, you know, there are issues around, um, you know, that. But, yeah, I mean, when we idle our vehicles, and I get it, you know, it's cold. Our engines may not start again if it's the middle of winter. But we, we there's something, you know, we need to bring out messaging about this, um, about how it impacts asthma rates, about how it impacts the health of children um, when you uh, idle your cars around schools or parks or whatever. Um, so I think that that's just like one very simple um, way. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of inroads here. Okay, but but simple is good, right? We like so simple. Give you, okay. and, to give you another example, yeah. sorry, around bike lanes. I know, you know, the city manager is getting a lot of flack around bike lanes. Bike lanes isn't just about climate change. It's about health. Every bike that is on that, on that bike lane, not only is it a healthier person, but less pollution from those cars, right? Like we saw the, the air quality statements in Edmonton. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and we saw it reduced over uh, the air quality improve over COVID when people weren't driving their cars in the first year or so. Mm -hmm. um, totally. I'm, I'm also wondering about, um, you talked about, you know, getting in earlier um, to have these discussions. I, I know at one time there used to be an Office of the Environment, and is that maybe where the dedicated admin person came from, Jacob, or do you know? Uh, I don't know if th that was the name. I'd have to go back and check. Okay, and ask. okay. I, I was just um, wondering, and but but to have somebody in in that dedicated space then would greatly improve the committee's yeah. ability to do their work. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Awesome. Well, great, and thank you very much for your work. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And so, thank you for the presentation, Jack. Very nice to see you again today. Um, Hi. So, my first question is regarding attachment one for the 2022 annual report. I didn't see the financial information and for 2022. So, can you comment on? Why yeah, it's actually on. Um, it's on the third attachment. The the budget, I think, is what you're asking for. Uh, no, this attachment oh. three is a budget for 2023, yeah. 2024. I am talking about expenditure and actual uh, expenses happened in 2022. So I didn't see that financial report in attachment one. So I think what we've submitted is the past budget of the last year. It was not like an expected budget. It was kind of um, retrospective. Um, we did not submit a expected budget for the future for this incoming year, mostly because, again, I think we kind of just expected that it would be more or less the same. We don't really have a lot of expenses outside of honorariums and travel expenses, and we have the same amount of people. So um, it should more or less be the same. So then my question to administration and Mayor Sohi, if I may ask to administration. I don't know who is here from administration to ask, answer these kind of I, I, This is, is I, there I, anybody from delegation, part of we, delegation from administration? Sorry, Mayor, I'm interrupting you. I apologize. Uh, I do believe we have Chandra Tamaris from um, Urban Planning and Economy, uh, but I don't know if, if she's available to answer. Uh, okay, I I'm online, and I I could try to answer the question. Okay, Anna, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, can can you can can we go ahead to uh, yeah. can you please uh, answer uh, try to answer that question if you don't mind, Chandra? Uh, I can repeat my question okay, first. Go ahead. go ahead. So my question is about and is from reporting a standardized perspective and each annual report for the past year including financial reports and also for the work plan for the 2023-24 including the budget information so i just didn't see the financial information for the past year i only saw in attachment three for the 2023 2024 this new year budget information so just wondering and why is that? Is there any specific reason for that? I'm not sure that's maybe a, a question I can respond to. Maybe if um, clerks could speak to maybe the, the, the report templates and then if the chairs want to talk to the decisions on what information they included in the report. Okay, so if this uh, answer we can we can touch touch base offline if I don't have answer for this one and I, I'm happy to do that and I'm, I just want to use time to go to my next question but thank you everyone um, my next question and to you for the new year budget because it's only about the members honor room and then also the transportation and the parking but I did see lots of actions you are planning to do in the new year so I'm wondering, and is there any possible cost or expenses could happen related to actions and in your work plan for 2023? And then if not including in the budget right now, uh, will be face the challenge in the future and for the financial shortfall? So that is my question. Um, I would say generally we consider ourselves our volunteer committee and a lot of the time, obviously the honorariums is relatively new for most of us on the committee, but every minute we spend on this committee is is basically agreed for us as a volunteer action or you know something that we give of ourselves. So we don't expect that to change. Okay, so you don't have anything and to change. And then my next question, and is there any outcome or output specific related to the actions listed in the work plan? So I didn't say it, I only say action list, but I didn't say as a result, what those action were needing to. Yeah, I think that kind of depends on um, the partnership that we receive from council and admin ultimately. You know, I think the outcome is kind of, um, you know, what we would like to see, you know, if Jacob and I wrote that is, Definitely, I mean, is, is a net neutral city by 2050, um, you know, and, and if we got everything that we wanted, that's what we would have. 
but of course that's probably not feasible it's also you know i mean we're going to try but it's probably pretty unlikely that we're going to get it hopefully we get close but that being said um yeah i think it's, it's difficult for us to say what will you know are the predicted outcomes um because i think that there's a lot up in the air uh considering the topic at hand okay thank you thank my time is out <laughs> thank, thank you, you. councillor rice councillor stevenson Yes, thanks so much. You know, I really appreciate, well, I appreciate all the work you do, but really appreciate the conversation about the health um, side of climate change. And just wondering if you've connected with um, the Coalition of Physicians for the Environment? It's funny that you asked, thank you, uh, Councillor Stevenson, because I am the incoming president for the uh, Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment. So we work closely with our CAPE which is the physician uh, group. We work closely with our Cape counterparts. And um, yeah, you know, we're also trying to go out there and make a name for ourselves. Uh, and we do a lot of stuff across the country. Excellent, great. Well, I really appreciate that you're bringing that lens. And I know our local chapter is, is very strong and active. So I'm excited for a future collaboration if you can have with them. Thank you totally. guys for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. Thank you. I am really uh, interested and intrigued by the idea of uh, climate action or climate emergency task force. Uh, I think it's very, uh, I think something to seriously think about, right? So uh, uh, we'll follow up with uh, with Andre. Um, I also want to get your thoughts on the, uh, yes, the task force will allow it that culture change uh, and, uh, and, and coordination of various players within the city, right? But you also see that as a as a vehicle for cultural shift in the broader community, right? Yeah, I mean that's the goal, right? If you start changing things from the inside, and hopefully that starts impacting what happens on the outside. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because there's another aspect where I think people haven't fully grasped this. Yeah, that climate action is also an economic action for economic growth, for jobs. For example, uh, you may have seen this in the news a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, the, uh, the cement company um, Heidenberg announced $1.3 billion investment in our city, and Edmonton will be the first city in north in the world to have a net zero cement production facility built here so that's hundreds and hundreds of jobs thousands of jobs at the same time uh, reduce emissions by 1 million ton right which is equivalent of taking 300,000 uh, uh, cars off the road annually right so i think understanding that aspect of climate action on the and the, uh, uh, on economic growth. You think a task force could facilitate that kind of conversation in a broader way in the community? That's amazing. I hadn't heard of that myself, but um, that is super exciting. And yeah, you know, again, this is kind of about important messaging that I think the broader public should hear and would benefit to hear about. You know, um, there's opportunities like that. And of course, bringing it back to the health is that these um, climate related health co like consequences are going mm -hmm. to sink us. You know, it's going to be extremely expensive to absorb um, some of these increasing health costs. Uh, and again, I know that that is not a city issue necessarily, but you know, we care about these things as a society, I'd like to think. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know it will definitely, I think it will, we'll dig deeper into that a little bit more. Yes. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for, thank you so much for planting that seed actually, because it's so important that uh, we- uh, That's we why we're here. Work. Yeah, okay. We're planting Good. seeds. All right. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Yeah. Uh, so that concludes the questions to both of you. Once again, thank you so much for your leadership and uh, and the work you and the rest of the committee members do. Please do let them know that we value their work. Thank you. All right, take care. All right, uh, Councillor Salvador. Happy to move that this report be received for information. <clears throat> okay, uh, need a seconder? Second. Councillor Jan? Second. Second. Yeah. Okay, Councilor Jan, second that. All right, so please vote. Yes, for me, Madam Clerk. 
Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Yes, for me as well. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yes, for me. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We are going to carry on to our next uh, item, which is Edmonton Salutes Committee, ESC 2022 Annual Report and 2023 Work Plan. And we have with us the chair of ESG, Brian Hodgson, uh, attending virtually. Nice to see you again, Brian. Please go ahead. Hey, Your Worship, I gather I'm going to see you on uh, sa Saturday evening at the Poultry Ab Family. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, Your Worship, uh, Councillors, you have in front of you, or you will have read several of the uh, documents uh, sent to you, and it is uh, my uh, suggestion that I proceed in virtue of uh, just giving you some highlights from uh, the, the report. So the mandate of the Evidence Salutes Committee is to promote and recognize our local military, regular and reserves, community contribution abroad. And this is a uh, council committee with a council uh, representative on it, Councillor Karen Principe, who has done excellent work. I think is very supportive of the work of the committee and the partition, uh, participation of re uh, regional mayor, uh, the military, both and the committee. So the work of the committee is to support um, the aforementioned groups and international events um, impact Edmonton and folks who live here. And I'm referring to the situation in Ukraine and the fact that the Canadian Army deployed in Latvia is significant uh, force in connection with the uh, circumstances there Brian, as well. Much you, lesser. Brian, you're, uh, you're breaking out a bit at the edges of your sentences, right? So uh, can you just check your mic if you don't mind? Okay, I'm speaking to you from my computer, so I'm not sure what I have to do. Is that better? Uh, yeah, let's try that. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Uh, as I was just saying, uh, geopolitics figure in the operational tempo of the Edmonton garrison uh, and um, those uh, political events relating to the situation in Eastern Europe, particularly the Ukraine, and uh, perhaps to electric uh, in the Asia-Pacific area, um, will have uh, some consequences for the level of military uh, activity. And Eminent Salutes supports the military families um, in, in various ways. The uh, reports that you have in front of you kind of outline some of those activities. And uh, the, the uh, council report uh, consists of three attachments. And if you want to drill down into the specifics of those, perhaps we can do that uh, at, uh, at the end of my presentation and I'll take questions. So the annual report uh, 2022 outlines the work of the committee and the press on the outcomes, uh, the strategic plan and the budget summary. Um, the work plan, the priorities, which means the intended work of the committee uh, in 2023, how it connects with the city priority. And finally, 2022 budget, breaks down the budget expenditures of the committee in 2022, which incidentally, uh, by my calculations, uh, in the past, in 2022, spent 0 0.0001381368 percent of the overall city budget of 3.64 million, or at least that that was given to me. So the Evidence Salutes Committee is well on its way to achieving many of the goals uh, that we set out in our strategic plan uh, for 21 uh, to 24. And the first goal, the committee attended and or sponsored several events related to uh, their mandate and committee members, uh, 25 of us, um, you know, have found out to attend these, these various events um, throughout uh, 2022 and indeed into this year, of course. 
goal two, community and military relations. Uh, we continue our relationship with the local and community and engage uh, with new partners uh, like Operation Restoration and Operation uh, Treble Victor. Uh, person to person or fast to fast, as the French might say, uh, connection was problematic during COVID, but I'm pleased to report that uh, as that situation seems to have ameliorated what we are now in a position where we're, we're meeting folks. And that uh, has been, I think, a very effective aspect of his work. Uh, effective governance. So uh, we have four subcommittees that develop new policies, uh, procedures, and orientation um, methodologies, and uh, have come up with several recommendations for the whole uh, committee. So the Evans Loose Committee uh, and its work meet the values and the goals of the city as it connects with connects with uh, the, the uh, belong reserve values city plan and the city's goal to be the community and prosperous regional park. Um, I have to say that I'm very pleased with the input and support that we get from uh, regional mayors and, and members of the Evans Loop Committee, uh, and they feel a part of the team, uh, which is which is a very, a very good thing. Uh, our budget was not spent uh, completely as the COVID precautions were still being considered um, along with savings and administrative expenses. Uh, our 2023 budget reflects a new reality of uh, virtual meetings, uh, although we are planning sort of a hybrid mix. Our meeting uh, next, or this month, I should say, will be in person. Um, and various other admin administrative savings allow us to, uh, to uh, provide funds um, and savings to our in military outreach. So some of our key activities from 2022, including uh, which include supporting the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force 408 Tactical Hel Helicopter Squadron 8. I think that was a weekend event. And uh, some of you were involved in uh, hosting crew members from Majesty's Canadian Ship Nonsuch, or sorry, His Majesty's Canadian Ship uh, Edmonton. Uh, which of course is named after the city. Uh, unfortunately, I was in conflict with COVID during during that. Um, providing uh, opportunities for military families to enjoy concerts and music uh, musicals from the Citadel and Spear. Uh, I think this serves a a double um, result. Uh, the military families are are recognized, but also we're supporting our our cultural uh, institutions, if you like. And I can tell you that these things are always fully subscribed and uh, eagerly uh, look forward to here. Um, we support community and military partners uh, like the Veterans Association Food Bank, uh, the Military Family Resource Center and the Canadian Forces Liaison Council, which uh, works to um, improve the relationship between civilian employers uh, and their reservists who may be working for them. You know, in the in connection with um, supporting uh, military families and veterans, it's interesting to note that uh, veterans are very much overrepresented in the homeless community in terms of a percentage of the population. Um, I'll just just make make that make that note. So I'd also say that the mayor and um, many members of council, if not all, have uh, attended and supported a number of events that uh, support the aims and objectives of the Evidence Salutes uh, Committee from Remembrance Day service to other, other um, uh, veterans and military events. So I'll stop there. And I would certainly entertain questions on any of the attachments that you have. I don't propose to go into detail, um, but I, I'm pleased to add, you might have. Thank you Your so worship. much. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. And please also convey our deepest appreciation to the rest of the committee members, because the work you do is so important. And uh, military personnel and military families are so integral 
to uh, to Edmonton, and uh, we deeply appreciate their contributions to uh, to our city, to our province and country, and to the world, uh, making it a better place and a safe place. So, uh, so thank you so much for that, uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, questions uh, uh, to Brian. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll, oh, here we go, Councillor Tang, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Brian, for that uh, very thorough um, review and, and presentation. Um, I had, I was wondering about three things. Um, one, I, I may have missed this, but I was wondering if um, kind of the size of the military community that, um, that Edmonton Sloot support has, uh, ex you know, increased in size in, in, over the last year as you see perhaps more folks coming back. Um, wondering if you can shed some light on that. There are about 4,500 members of the uh, regular fort in the Edmonton garrison. Uh, about 1,000 reservists, take two or 300. And the member of the Edmonton garrison, regular uh, aspect of it, you know, rotate um, so but they're stationed here. So their families remain. Uh, you know, in addition, there are at least uh, 10,000 veterans that are uh, receive some assistance or have some involvement with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that number of veterans, probably perhaps a fifth of the veterans community because uh, DVA veterans who don't require any, any assistance or have not asked for any assistance. VA. So the, it's a significant number mm -hmm. overall. That's so helpful. I, question, Councillor? Yes, yes. No, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I was just noting um, on one of your three, uh, f under your three goals, effective governance, I think this question uh, or this activity for later uh, is really interesting to understand what the environment would look like if Edmonton Sluice did not exist. And, and so I'm just curious, would you be doing some, you know, dedicated evaluation uh, work on that? Well, I think yeah, the answer to that, there are, we have no plans to, uh, to, to do that. I think the Edmonton Sluice Committee, which, which was originally formed uh, as a result of the move up the Army from Calgary, and the, the widespread satisfaction amongst members of the Canadian forces who were stationed in Calgary uh, at having to move to Edmonton. Now, in the event, um, once they got here, they found that housing was significantly less expensive and that Edmonton was a terrific garrison city. And as I said to uh, folks, it's probably the best garrison city in Canada if you ask the forces who've been here. So, um, you know, given that the budget of Edmonton Salutes is 0 0.0018 of overall city budget. I would strongly argue that it's pretty good value for money. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and I guess, uh, oh, go ahead. I going to say, go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, I because um, I think I think the way you structure this report is really interesting, like with the now, soon, and then later, um, and then kind of similarly for the recon, uh, recognition. Oh no, not recognition. Sorry, the community. Uh, the goal too with the later is to grow that number of regional municipalities. I think for some reason I thought I, all the regional municipalities are already participating, but um, perhaps I'm wrong. Well, I, we do have a number of uh, regional municipalities that uh, that are involved, and I can. They're active uh, members and supporters, and our overall attack uh, uh, of those individuals is very high and well over 80 percent average. Yeah. So they they feel a part of the greater ed effort in this, that's which is great. a good. Yes, that's great. Um, and just lastly, you had touched on very aptly. You know, um, veterans are overrepresented in the houseless community. Uh, I'm just curious. You know, I'm aware of a few different projects when it comes to veterans housing, um, but has this um, has your committee com uh, been interacting on this front with perhaps other external or even city initiatives at all when it comes to housing or um, housing supports? We're, I think, at active advocates for uh, for the, for veterans, including the homeless, supported homes for here. Initiative that That's was. Right. Uh, That's right. I remember that. 
Yeah, um, and would continue through the you know like support of the Veterans Food Bank, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and others. We will support any uh, veterans organization. We do have a governance model that um, uh, assesses requests and a, and a certain uh, pro forma, if you will, that must be completed. And we do a, a fairly thorough evaluation uh, for any request for support. But you know, beyond financial support, you know, there's moral support and moral support. So members of the Evidence Salutes Committee, when they're out to folks, and, and, and certainly that's one of my objectives is to get out and talk to people, mm. uh, we let them know, you know, what, what's going on as we see it out there and, and, and where there might be issues that individuals and, and, and others can assist. That's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. Yeah, I just want to follow up then on that. Like, I, it is very, very, very concerning to, uh, to, uh, to hear and uh, know that uh, uh, veterans are overrepresented in, uh, in, in houselessness. Houseless itself is very concerning. Uh, uh, no one should be houseless. Uh, 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 just want to understand what are some of the drivers like you uh like what are some of the reasons that veterans fall into houselessness well that's a good question and and then certainly uh, uh, just to clarify my my comment if you took the the uh, uh, percentage of veterans as a pop at the percentage yeah. of the canadian pop for all yeah paired that to uh the homeless Veterans are overrepresented. Yeah. There's other groups that are in greater number, to be clear. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So wh what causes that? That's a very interesting question, and probably beyond the scope of me giving you a brief answer, only to say to you that in the United Kingdom and in the United States, it's the same. Hmm, really? Yeah, yeah. So the reasons behind that, uh, certainly uh, members of the forces who you know, have been on operational deployments and have seen things, I'm now talking about PTSD, or moving from uh, a place where, uh, you know, there's a certain degree of stress uh, into civilian life, where perhaps, mm. you know, those things don't exist. Um, you know, I would have to, I, I can get back to you with with, with uh, a, a, a more fulsome answer. No. Yeah, please. I would. I, I'm really interested in that. I think it has to be part of our conversation around houselessness in uh, in Edmonton. So understanding some of the reasons and what the solutions can, can be, right? So uh, as we are engaging with our other partners in the province and the feds and the community about uh, our work together on ending houselessness, would love to. Would I think we need to understand more deeply how we can help on understanding the reasons and then the solutions. Thank you. So yeah. Well, I'll get something together for you and, yeah. um, and members of council. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Brian, that concludes the questions to you. And once again, thank you so much for your good work and uh, and committee's good work. Uh, see you on Saturday. You bet. And I want to commend uh, the uh, city staff who work in support of the committee, particularly Natasha Weber. Um, you know what? They're they're first class, and certainly they've uh, made a huge difference in uh, the work of this committee. So thanks to all of them. Yeah, thank you for your kindness toward them. Really appreciate it. Thank you for acknowledging their work. Yeah. Uh, with that, I'll go to Councillor uh, Prince Bay to move over to the chair. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian, for being here tonight and uh, online with us. And thanks for all the work you do. So much appreciated. And it's my pleasure to uh, move uh, item 5.3. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay. Need a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Wright Rice, Wright Rice. <laughs> right, Councillor Rice, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you. And next we have uh, Edmonton Combative, Combative Sports Commission ECSG 2022 Annual Report and 2023 Work Plan. And joining us 
uh, from uh, the uh, ECSCR Chair, uh, Trevor Kelly, and Vice Chair, Tai Bab. Uh, both are joining us virtually. Go ahead, please. And thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for your work. And uh, so who's going to start first? or? Uh, uh, I will be speaking, uh, presenting the report and the work plan, and uh, Ty and myself will both be available for answering any questions afterwards. Okay, thank you so much. And Councillor Nack, can you take the chair? I just need to step out for a bit, right? So, yeah. And Absolutely, Nack. I have the chair. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Councillors and Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for having us this evening. Um, I'll be presenting the Commission's annual report and work plan. And uh, afterwards, we'll be answering any questions which you may have. I'll begin my presentation by briefly discussing the Commission's mandate. Uh, as you may be aware, there are three parties that work together to regulate professional combative sports within the City of Edmonton. First, of course, is City Council, which passes bylaws which permit and govern professional combative sports, as well as set out the roles and responsibilities for the Commission and its Executive Director as well as setting out rules for licensing of promoters, contestants, and events. The executive director of the commission is a city of Edmonton employee who's responsible for all the operational matters involving combative sports, including employment and training of officials, approval of licensing applications and event permits, and general operational oversight of sanctioned events. The third, of course, is the commission ourselves. Uh, the commission is a council committee created by bylaw 15638, and it is composed of seven volunteer citizen members. Uh, presently, there's no vacancies in the commission, though we will be going through uh, recruitment as, as of at the end of April, we'll be, we will be losing three members and requiring uh, three new members to take their place. Uh, the commission itself, um, um, meaning the, the seven volunteer members, we do not take a regular, uh, an operational role in the regulation of combative sports. Our purpose primarily is with respect to regulating in matters of governance only, such as making policies and regulations which supplement the city bylaws um, that uh, oversee combative sports within the city. The commission also serves a role as acting as an appeal body for any decisions of the executive director concerning licensing applications uh, that might be appealed by uh, pr potential promoter um, that, that might not uh, be successful in uh, applying for a license or an event permit. So 2022 was a challenging year for the commission, uh, similar to 2020 and 2021. Uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic continuing into the beginning of the year, especially with the emergence of the Omicron variant, uh, we had put a pause on accepting um, promoter applications and event permits. Uh, as in the early months of the year, the pandemic uh, numbers were increasing again, and we felt at the time that it was unsafe to put on any uh, events. However, um, towards the late spring, early summer, uh, we lifted that pause. Um, however, um, another challenge arose preventing the any combative sporting events from taking place, which was namely the pause that was put in place in August by city administration. So that pause uh, was uh, a nine month pause. Um, till at least May of 2023. So as a result of that pause, uh, that once again, uh, there have been no combative sporting events uh, this past year. So the last time an actual combative sporting event uh, took place within the city was in December of 2019. However, um, as we understand it, there is you know, interest among potential promoters uh, for putting on events. So. Assuming that this pause um, does not go beyond May of 2023 and that operations can resume, it would be our expectation that there could potentially be some combative sporting events uh, later on in the year. Uh, notwithstanding the pause, the commission itself has tried to keep busy, um, continuing to focus on its work. 
Over the last several years, the Commission has undertaken a comprehensive review of all of its policies, um, primarily focusing first on three uh, critical policies concerning uh, licensing of contestants and seconds, licensing of officials, and uh, most importantly of all, uh, medical requirements for contestants. So following that review um, and discussion and, and research and work we did in 2019 and 2020, um, we engaged the services of a external consultant to help us with um, doing a stakeholder engagement survey uh, to canvas members of the combative sports community with respect to uh, their thoughts on our proposed changes to those three policies. Uh, that report was completed last year and following, um, you know, receipt of the um, report, uh, which didn't indicate any concerns with among the combative sports community, we finally implemented those new changes. So we uh, brought in those new regulations, which replaced the old outgoing policies. As a result of the um, pause, uh, another issue was brought to the Commission's attention, which was namely that there had been a policy uh, in place that had been stayed uh, with respect to its enforcement since approximately 2017. This was a policy concerning um, the handling of athletes and officials who may have participated in unsanctioned events and what to do with them. Uh, so that is another thing that we did in 2022 was to uh, do a review of that policy and provide some recommendations to city administration as to what kind of changes could be made to uh, bring that policy uh, back into effect once the stay is, uh, uh, the pause on events is lifted. Uh, beyond that, um, we held a retreat in July of 2022 uh, for the purpose of planning out a substantive work plan uh, for approximately the next, well, at the time, the next two years. Although some of the action items um, that we um, put together for that work plan, uh, we haven't actioned yet, uh, largely as a result of the pause on um, events that was put in place by city administration. Uh, the commission is largely taking somewhat of a wait and see approach uh, to see whether or not um, the pause does in fact, you know, lift in May of 2023, or if anything, you know, further is required from the commission, uh, whether, um, you know, participating in that review. Um, largely, the commission has not been involved in any uh, capacity with that pause and the review that's being done by city administration. Financially, um, the commission is still in good shape. Um, this, the commission does not receive any funding from the city whatsoever. Um, we do not receive uh, tax revenue. Instead, we are self-funded uh, through um, events that are put on. Now, although there haven't been any events uh, since December 2019, we had the benefit of the fact that there were two UFC events, one in 2017, another in 2019, both of which uh, provided significant revenue to the commission such that um, although we haven't had any revenue whatsoever in uh, two and a half years, uh, our, the commission's account still has surplus funds in excess of $200,000, uh, more than sufficient to meet any anticipated budgetary requirements. Largely, uh, those may consist of, of training, um, uh, opportunities. Uh, right now, we're looking at potentially sending a, dele get a delegation of commission members to the annual conference for the Association of Boxing Commissions. Uh, as well, we may look into uh, further uh, appeals training. As I mentioned before, the commission serves at, or acts as an appeal body. Uh, in 2021, we did undergo uh, for almost every commission member um, a training through the um, Foundation of uh, Administrative Justice, uh, basically administrative tribunal training in effect. Uh, however, um, 
as of the end of this month, I believe uh, I will be the only remaining member of the commission who will have undergone that training back in 2021. So it might be something that we would want to look at um, revisiting and doing that training again uh, for the new incoming members that will be hopefully joining us in May. Um, so subject to any questions, that summarizes um, the annual report for the Combative Sports Commission. Thank, thank you so much. I'll take the chair back, Councillor Neck. Uh, okay, sure. Really appreciate uh, your presentation and uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I will see if council members have any questions to you. Just here we go, Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you so much um, for uh, for that report. And even though there's no events, there's still lots of, lots being done. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I was. Can you? I was just wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on that pause. Um, so, so, so why was the pause in place? Just so because of pandemic the, I mean, circumstances. The, the, the pause was was um, uh, put in place um, in, in August of two thousand twenty two. Um, as I said, it's it's a city administration uh, driven pause. My understanding is that um, it was at the direction of the uh, deputy city manager. Um, okay. Largely, um, I, I, I'm not in a position. I'm not well equipped oh, uh, to comment on it as a result of the fact that the commission didn't really have anything to do with the pause. Okay. And okay. So, so this might be a better suited question for administration. Yes. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who will be able to answer that from administration. Just wanted to understand more of the context. Oh, David. I, yeah, hi, Councilor. Thanks David very much David for the question. Oh. Um, now, the, the one thing that I wanted to clarify, because I know um, Trevor talked about two pauses, one that was because of pandemic related issues and then the, the later one. Are you you're talking about the one that we have on currently? Yeah, the August one. Although if it's nine months, it would have been done this month. Uh, it's mid it's mid May. Yeah, it's mid May oh. that it's coming to. Yeah. Um, so what we wanted to do is uh, in light of uh, some risks involved and uh, some outstanding work from um, kind of an overview uh, that was done by an external consulting firm. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had all of our T's crossed and I's dotted and, and made sure that uh, sort of the, uh, the, the risk reward um, for the city uh, providing oversight for combative sports was um, was clear, and uh, we'd fully analyzed it because uh, I think the the pandemic kind of threw everything into a bit of a, a, a churn, and this wasn't fully addressed um, prior to the pandemic. So it gave us some time to just reconsider everything that we're looking at. So we're in the final stages of putting that risk report together. Uh, and um, and we'll be able to present it to ELT and the city manager shortly. Okay, so that it's not necessarily a decision that requires council. Then sounds like you're. It's more well, I think resolved. I think that entirely depends on um, the recommendations that we put in front of uh, ELT and the city manager, and then what they decide to do with it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so that'll be mid May. Great. Thank. Thanks for that context. That helps. Um, and then I guess Trevor, I was just uh, I was just noting that even though you didn't have any events, you did you do have a significant surplus, but you still were able to generate some license fees um, as revenue. So is that just pr primarily so, promoter? Uh, so so um, I should say that was an anticipated budget uh, oh, okay. that we had put together. Um, the short answer is uh, because that that budget that was put together in July. Um, about two weeks <laughs> before we found out about the pause. Uh, so at that time, there had been some indication of interest in uh, events being potentially put on by hopeful promoters, uh, targeting putting on an event in around October of 2022. But of course, as a result of the pause, that wasn't able to happen. So uh, we, the, the commission has had no revenue since 2019. Right. Okay. Got it. And 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 um, so I'm just noting also your awards dinner that was removed 
uh, this would have been before that dis that pause decision. Yeah. So this is just in light of you know it's been quiet and there's not many events. Is that is that why? Yeah. Basically, um, <laughs> in in a, in the simplest terms possible, as I said, that was a prospective budget put together last summer, sure. which would apply you know on a go forward basis, provided that uh, events were able to resume. Um, following the pause, if the pause, you know, ends in May and the decision is uh, made by city administration to resume uh, regulating combative sports, that, you know, the same number of events could eventually happen. Now, the budget is primarily based upon the presumption that it would not be a UFC event going on because the amount of revenues would be, you know, over 100,000 if it was a UFC event as opposed to a smaller right. Uh, boxing or mixed martial arts uh, promoter. Um, it's based on, I believe, one or two events if, you know, a more smaller sized event were to happen. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm out of time. I appreciate your work and I appreciate, uh, you know, keep uh, everyone keeping up their training uh, even through this period. Thank you for that update. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Councillor Jans, go ahead, please. Um, Councillor Tank kind of... Uh, unpacked a bunch of it for me. So I just want to extend my gratitude to the committee and the volunteers for their help and service. Um, I was wondering maybe if uh, uh, Chair Kelly, on a lighter note, um, I uh, I asked when I was elected, one of the returning councillors, why the commission didn't oversee uh, WWE events. And I was told some lies that it is uh, fake and professional wrestling, and that is not under the purview of the Sports Commission. So I was wondering if you could just dispel some of this misinformation. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, I, as I recall, um, up until I believe late 2018, uh, professional wrestling events were actually under the purview of the commission. Uh, and then that was subsequently changed um, such that they're, they're unfortunately, they're no longer um, under a jurisdiction. But that's not because of the the tr the the truthiness of the activities, right? It's it's because of um, other management reasons, right? I I'm not sure. Okay, I'll, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll consult the mayor's office on this and the existence of Santa Claus. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. You as well. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, Chair Kelly, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I do have the question regarding the budget planning for yes. ADAPT July 11th, 2022. Uh, specific, there is a statement in the document talk about ECSC does not request, nor does it receive any tax levy funding from the city. And yeah. then specifically this one, and based on the budget information provided, because I noticed the revenue, the project revenue actually is much lower than uh, total expenses. And if you look at the cost and look at revenue here, and you can see some gaps here. So maybe you can comment on this statement more, and provide more information. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase a bit? Oh, uh, I could re, re, yeah, rephrase them more. So in this, report, there is a statement, is under notes for the budget. Can you provide yes. more information regarding the last statement you put there and in the documents? Well, con concerning the, that the, yeah, the, the commission does not receive tax le levy funding. Yes. And uh, how that, what I, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. So how this reflect the big gap between the revenue and then expenses? So the, um, as I said, the, the, the anticipated revenue was under the assumption that, you know, perhaps in 2022, uh, we would have been able to regulate one event. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, we were doing about five events per year um, 
because at, at the time there was a local boxing promoter, KO Boxing, and they're, they're typical, uh, typically they would put on four events a year, uh, one for March, June, September, and December of every, every calendar year. On top of that, there was the, always the anticipated, um, uh, you know, it, you know, as I said, the UFC came in 2017 and 2019. Um, so I, I think this was, you know, sort of a projection on, you know, if, um, you know, a new promoter were to come along uh, that, you know, likely we would be able to get one event, maybe two, um, you know, before the end of the 22 calendar year. Um, that being said, um, you know, I, I don't think our, our expenses are, you know, came anywhere near uh, what was projected either um, because no, no training or travel outside of Canada occurred. Um, you know, I, I would have to look back to see what our actual expenses were. So okay. um, suffice it to say, um, you know, th this is a budget based on the possibility of only one event occurring. Um, but you know, the, the actual revenue, as I said, um, all it takes is one UFC event to, you know, okay. totally throw those numbers out of whack, uh, because the revenue from one UFC event, as I said, is over a hundred thousand dollars for the commission. So also in, in the reports indicated very clear, if you do not have surplus and how you feel of that deficit and between 11. 11,500 and between 11,500 and 36,500 if you don't have surplus. Um, I am just a little bit uh, concerned about you don't have surplus and also you didn't uh, receive any tax levy funding from the city, but how you cover that deficit? Well, as I said, we, we, we have over $200,000 in our account at the moment. Mm. Okay. Uh, so that means the information I read in the report is a little bit different. Uh, but thank you for that uh, $200,000 uh, in your account clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ray. So that concludes the questions, uh, Trevor and uh, Ty. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am going to go to Councilor Jans to move the recommendation. Councilor Jans? So moved. Thank you. Second. Second by Councilor Tang. Please vote. Good afternoon. Yes, Jim. Thank you, Councilor Cartmel. And just checking, I believe Councillor Hamilton needed to step away. Councillor Hamilton, have you rejoined us? Not seeing Councillor Hamilton, we will mark her as absent and we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right, uh, moving along, we'll go to our next item. Community Services Advisory Board 2022 Annual Report and 2023 Work Plan. And we have Chair Jenny Albers joining us in person. There you are. Nice to see you. All right, over to you. Uh, thank you so much for having me today, Mayor Sowie, and to all the city councillors, both in person and virtually. Um, so my name is Jenny Albers. I am the chair of the Community Service Advisory Board. I've been on the board for the last year and excited to go through our annual report. Uh, so next slide, please. So a bit of a board overview. So the Community Services Advisory Board, also known as CSAB, uh, provides advice to uh, council and the city of Edmonton to assist in long-term planning for community services. So that includes advising on social policy, arts, culture, recreation, and sport. Uh, as well, there's two big working committees underneath of CSAB that I'm sure you're aware of do lots of grant funding in the community. So we have FCSS, which is the Family and Community Support Services, as well as CIOG, which is the Community Investment Operating Grant. Next slide, please. 
a little bit of an overview in 2022. So our board is comprised of 13 board members. Uh, we did have a large board recruitment and change in 2022. So we had six new board members, including myself as the new chair, as well as the new vice chair last year. Uh, which is really impressive is our total volunteer hours. So that includes both the community services advisory board as well as FCSS and CIOG had a total of 778 hours. Definitely proud of all of our volunteer commitment. So some of the highlights around uh, how we advised city council and city administration in 2022. Uh, there is a lot of different pieces around city priorities, um, specifically to the community services department. So that included process and priority based budgeting, specifically around the 23 to 26 uh, budget planning, uh, looking at fees and service review for community and recreation, uh, being involved in community safety and well-being task force uh, to provide feedback and engagement. Uh, as well, we engaged with uh, increasing diversity in the workforce for fire rescue services and then engagement around the warehouse park and alcohol in parks. Next slide, please. So a bit around the grant allocation for 2022. So for both the CIOG and FCSS. So the Community Investment and Operating Grant uh, provides operating assistance for nonprofit organizations. Uh, it was very exciting year to provide 3.6 million in funding. Um, it was provided to 208 organizes, organizations over the last year. Um, as well for FCSS, uh, that one is a little bit different. So it's municipal and provincial partnership. So the province pays in 80% and then the city or another municipality pays in 20%. Uh, so it's an ongoing funding partnership to ensure communities in Alberta are both supportive, safe, uh, inclusive and engaged. Uh, we did a lot of work re-looking at the funding granting process uh, for the coming years. And it was a very exciting to be able to provide 16.5 uh, 16 million in program funding, then 3.8 million in partnership funding. Um, so over 20 million in total for FCSS. Uh, and that ended up with 72 agencies in the community that were funded um, and 114 programs. So it was very exciting. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for 2023, uh, we've outlined a bit of our priorities. Of course, we'll be working specifically with community services department to align with their priorities, as well as the city priorities ongoing. So some of our priorities include working on the public spaces bylaw review, as well as looking at community and safety well-being, um, and then also just continuing to work on affordable housing as well. So it's an exciting year, especially after the 2026 budget cycle. Um, so we're really looking forward uh, to all the progress that we'll do. Um, but just a big thank you overall to city administration, specifically in community services. Um, also the office of the city clerk has been very supportive uh, through all of the membership um, and orientation pieces. And of course to Councillor Wright, uh, who supported our board uh, through the last year and uh, for all their dedication on that end. Um, so yeah, thank you so much and open to any questions and I also have city administration here uh, to support if needed. Well, thank you so much and thank you for your work and the work of your team. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. And uh, uh, so with that, I'm going to go to Councillor Wright for questions. How do you do so much on such a small budget? Did I know? <laughs> um, but I'm, you, it is such a broad mandate. How do you determine what to focus on. I mean, it's everything from parks to the fire service. I mean, my gosh. So it is interesting because community services, especially in the city is so broad, like that social policy lens, arts, culture, recreation, sport. So I think a lot of it really works with our board that we have at the time too, um, to see where their interests lie and where they really want to share their feedback and voice on advising city council at Amin. Um, so even with our priorities that we have in the work plan for this year, I will say with our board, we're gonna have about half of the membership overturning in the next month. We will have to revisit our work plan to make sure that those priorities still fit the new board structure. Um, and that's the direction that we want to continue to move in. So, um, but it's very interesting. I think a lot of it, it really depends on that board development, their interests. A lot of them work in the nonprofit sector. So that has been a huge focus. Um, and we wanna bring their skills and experience. But of course, it's aligning to city priorities as well and ensuring that we're supporting city admin and providing that engagement throughout. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, with the work in community safety and well-being and that as well. Um, 
And then I'm, I'm also wondering about the impact of the CIOG grant funding. What's that going to do for the year coming up? So our applications have closed for it, and I believe we've had over 280 applications so far. Um, so the administration is just reviewing right now and going over it. Uh, for this year, I think we're just going to review CIOG, part of the 25% that was funded, um, and relook at the other operating grants that are provided throughout community services. And then we'll have to bring that back to the board and see in the future, is this enough to be funded as an operating grant or will we be requesting sort of additions to that? Because we want to make sure the organizations are supported but also know that there's other operating grants available in the space. Okay, so it, if they are declined, at least try to find some other options for them? Okay. Councillor, I'd just like to correct that number. Ooh, oh, that was okay. loud, sorry. Um, it was actually just over 200 applications and 180 are actual eligible for the grant. So, oh, okay. So the number is quite lower compared to the um, 308 we funded last year, so. Um, okay. And the amount is substantially reduced, is that right? Is well, the, the budget's substantially different yeah. than from before. We'll just have to wait to see how we can, once all the, uh, once we've figured out who is all in, then we can run some tests on different scenarios to figure out. And at the next CSAB meeting, um, that committee will bring a report forward to make sub some suggestions for pre-appeals and where our limit, our lower and upper limit might be, okay. so. Okay, and, um, and the, um sort of the criteria has changed as well as to who can qualify for the CIOG now? Yeah, we've d we followed that discussion that we had before about the two streams of one being active recreation and amateur sport and then the other stream being social services. The biggest change was the um, eligibility around the operating funding, like the limit we went to, we changed it to $500 thousand dollars the committee wanted to really focus on smaller and medium size uh, not-for-profits which I think w you know w would be reflective of how council has been approaching things and then the other piece we increased was the amount of Edmontonian participation uh, we raised that number up higher as well uh, as well as continued this will be the second year that we're asking um, for um, increased social inclusion and removing of barriers to participation Okay, so I think good good changes for that. Um, and then the FCSS funding, we actually contribute more than the 20% that we're required, don't we? Yes. Yes. Yes, we do. But I, I have to say, um, the reason we commit more is because we have a socially minded council. So um, how our contribution works is through uh, programs and services that we provide as a city that are eligible for that funding. Most of them related to our social development branch because those are the ones that we, we know more and we can count that in. Um, but yeah, we're usually over, over contributing. Okay. All right, thank you very much and, and thank you both for your work. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you so much uh, for being here, and thanks to your entire committee for all the work they do. I uh, really appreciate some of the stories in here, including the, the Assist Youth Program, large because it spells Tang. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to actually just continue on that thought about CIOG. I can't remember if it was last year's annual report or maybe it was administration report. I recall an FCSS Common Outcomes Framework project. Is that right, Judy? There's a Common Outcomes for United Way and FCSS. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and so I just wanted to know if that's still ongoing and if, if CSAP had plays a role in that at all, a kind of advisory role in It's still ongoing, but okay. no. Um, I see. CSAP has that role around helping make sure that we are providing the proper, with administration, the proper outcomes reporting and talks to agencies about that. Because I think it's a really interesting project and I was, I was curious if there's, um, you know, if, if the committee has ever talked about sort of value in something similar, now that there is a framework for say CIOG, uh, kind of getting at some of that common outcomes exercise. So we pulled the, oh. the two outcomes that we're using for CIOG, uh, they're very similar uh, to the outcomes, to some of the outcomes from FCSS that we're using to ground our framing of our uh, 
monitoring and evaluation framework for the social development branch. So we are trying to work to oh, align okay. things. That's great. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, and I was just one, uh, a couple questions on the budget. I mean, it's your actual significantly lower than budgeted. Uh, I was curious, what is FAC and program on demand? Um, what is it, you know, traditionally, what kind of programs that, is that typically? And then how come it was zero for last year? And then just um, recognizing the volunteer recognition is much smaller, but you still had a chance to recognize your volunteers, I imagine. For sure, I can go over a bit of information and then Judy can be more specific. So yeah, our budget definitely could look at being changed in the future because we're not using, there is um, all of our budget. Um, the most part of it is going to the honorariums and then the rest of it is around volunteer appreciation. So last year it was a lot of uh, virtual meetings still, so there's a few in person. Um, the majority of the budget for that actually went to an, a volunteer appreciation event at the Mutart Conservatory at the end of the year, um, where we gathered everyone in person. Um, so we definitely hope to do something similar in the future of that end. But the other pieces in the budget don't align as much. Like there was a past FCSS conference last year. However, that was covered by FCSS. Um, so the other pieces may have to be sort of managed differently in the budget moving forwards. But Judy might have more specifics about that one specific line. I think there's recognition that we have to update some of what's in here. So um, I don't know what some of the things mean, to be quite honest with you, because okay. we don't, like, I don't really work on establishing that budget. It's kind of what's been prepared. So I think I, I think it's something that's going to evolve as as we find out when once you get your report on the... Uh, the advisory boards and the review of what happens with that. If there's changes we need to make, I think that'll that'll help us reflect better on that. That's helpful context. Thank you. Um, and I was just uh, on the FCSS. You know that there's obviously a lot of advocacy around the province um, through the FCSS association. Um, wondering if CSEP is lending your voice to to some of these advocacy efforts. Just curious. Uh, I'll jump in and then Judy can add on. But yeah, for the FCSS, uh, there is like an FCSS committee from CSAB that does a lot of work. Uh, we do have some members on C CSAB on there as some different working group. Um, but it'd be up to the working group on the advocacy piece. I know they're working a lot more on the funding structure in that um, and still working on their plans for this year. So uh, Judy might know a little bit more from advocacy in the last year. Um, there's an advocacy package being developed um, from the association and also Intercity Forum on Social Policy that Councillor uh, Wright also attends with me, uh, or together we attend, um, uh, is, is working in conjunction on that as well. So I think there will be, and we'll be sharing that with our funded agencies so that they, their boards can support that uh, movement also. And it, it will be around, like you heard me talk at... Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Municipalities conference around uh, more funding. The yeah. the needs are growing all throughout the province, whether we're rural or urban, and prevention, as you know, with the in lots of discussions, is the is the way to start getting some of these solved in a really progressive way. Yeah, I really appreciate um, you providing your those responses, and uh, thank you again for all the work you and the volunteers are doing. Thank you, Councillor Dan. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And thank you, Jenny, and for your presentation. I do want to take this opportunity to say I really appreciate the report for 2022. Uh, actually, it's really impressive. And from a reporting perspective, lots of quantitative and qualitative information and combined there. So thank you for this uh, great report. Uh, I do have only have one quick question. Um, so I appreciate with little spending, like actually in 2022, only like 6,500 spending and did so much work. Um, for the uh, surplus compared to the original budgets and where this surplus go is carry on for the next year operating budget or return to city's 2022 budget. So do you know from that financial perspective? Yes, it gets returned into general revenue. Return to the general revenue and then into our city's operating budget. Yes. Okay, wonderful. That's only my question. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nat, can you take the chair? I just have a few I've got the chair. questions. Uh, 
on the uh, CIOG funding. Uh, I think that, am I right, that funding was eliminated, I think, 1920 and in, in, in that yes it was uh it wasn't part of the base budget it was added back in one time each of the two years oh. 21 and 22 through funding from the edmonton police services i see okay because before that i remember it was permanent then was reduced because of the city auditor's report or something right and uh, one time funding was allocated in 2021 and 2022. And I remember 2022 budget discussion, we allocated funding for one-time basis. But, and for budget 23 to 26 is four-year commitment, right? At, at a, yes, just under a million dollars. Yes, yeah, okay. I just needed that clarification. Yeah, okay, good. All right, thank you so much. I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. All right, okay. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes all the questions to you. And once again, thank you so much for all the good work you and your team and Jody you uh, uh, do and, uh, and, the, and the rest of the uh, committee members. Such a valuable, valuable work. And with that, I'll go to Councillor Wright to move the recommendation. Thank you. And I'd just like to again thank you, thank all the volunteers. I think the number of service hour, volunteer hours that they put in um, really is a testament to how much they do, and it's from their passion um, as well to contribute to the city. So thank you to everyone for that. So I would like to move that the April 19th, 2023 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 01723 be received for information. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. Yes for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Carrying on, we are on to next item. Naming Committee 2022 Annual Report and 2023 Work Plan. And we are joined by the Chair, Aaron McDonald. And joining us virtually. And with that, welcome, Aaron. And thank you so much to you and your committee. And I'll uh, pass on the, uh, uh, the mic over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Your Worship, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, councillors, and good evening. My name is Aaron McDonald, and I am the chair of Edmonton's naming committee. The naming committee's mandate is to name the city's development areas, parks, municipal facilities, roads, honorary roads and wards in accordance with and subject to any exemptions or restrictions imposed by our policy. Naming and the importance of place naming must be recognized. On the one hand, place names preserve some material and intangible cultural heritage by publicly memorializing important people, places, and events. On the other hand, place naming should not be seen in isolation from broader questions of social and spatial justice, especially in relation to racism, segregation, and ongoing legacies of white supremacy. Indeed, Colonial settler place naming strategies play a role in reaffirming dominant cultural authority on the physical landscape. With our new policy, the city has asked us to reflect on our naming practices and these notions of power, class, race, and gender. Specifically, we've observed that Edmonton's past naming policies have reflected historic settler ties to Europe erasing Indigenous place names and language, and limiting or excluding non-European place names from the map of Edmonton. Our place naming practices have also engendered patriarchal values. For instance, an initial analysis of Edmonton place names memorializing people from the 1950s through to the 2000s found that male place names such as Churchill and Harlech represent 57% of place names compared to seven percent reflecting female. In addition, there are no non-binary names on record. 
Now, for completeness, you should know that 36% of Edmonton Place names represent flora, fauna, or some other non-human representation. These names are metaphors for representation. When our citizens look at the geography of Edmonton, they should see themselves reflected in the mosaic of places that comprise the city. Who is represented and who has the power sends powerful signals of community values. Given that most of the place names have origins in the United Kingdom and Europe, and places are named most frequently for men, we are documenting a substantial underrepresentation of Edmonton's diversity in place names. So, in short, we feel our obligation is to evaluate the naming process through the lens of colonialism, as well as our new, more inclusive naming policy. So, this shift has moved us to our decision-making process. Our highlights from this past year reflect the shift in our approach. Our focus on diverse naming includes such names as Kisiwatsuin Park in the Alberta Avenue neighborhood and Mista Post Park in the Prince Rupert neighborhood, which was a renaming of a space that was formerly associated with Dan Knott. Our naming approvals were plentiful throughout the year, and we had the opportunity to use our new policy. You'll see a variety of those naming policy outcomes in our annual report. We've worked on our policy to action plan. We hope to table shortly a proposal for administration's review to discuss ways that we can approach naming to really enact the spirit of the revised naming policy. Our committee is completely volunteers. We work hard to ensure that the policy is in place and that we are meeting the needs of our community. This is important work and we appreciate your ongoing support and the support that we have received from civic administration. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation uh, and uh, and all the good work that you and the committee members have been doing here. It's uh, it's transformational and also you know reflecting on the history. It's, it's these are difficult conversations, and but you're leading those conversations. We really really appreciate that you're doing them in a in a very thoughtful way. Right. So thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'll open for questions from. Uh, Council members, uh, Councillor Tank, go ahead, please. Okay, great. Thank you, Erin, very much for that uh, very thoughtful presentation. Um, can you just uh, repeat the name you had mentioned uh, that was a reference to Dan Not or not uh, not a reference to him? <laughs> Correct. We. Uh, this is the Mista Post Park in the Prince Rupert neighborhood. And gotcha. it is, I believe, associated on the grounds next to the school that was also formerly of that name. Uh, Corey could confirm that for me as our administrative liaison. Uh, there is a Cree syllabic in the name as an official part of the formed name that was approved as well as uh, for the other indigenous Cree name. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um... That's helpful. Yeah, and I and and okay. I think when you said it, I didn't quite make the connection with um, the and the 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 report itself. Um, so you know, on your point about the fauna and flora, and I remember last year there was a very robust discussion uh, during your presentation about that. Um, are you seeing some of these requests coming in more reflect of that direction of moving in that direction of um, more focused on sort of the non-human tribute? Um, I'm just, um, yeah, so I'm just kind of curious what, what's the trend that you're seeing coming to in front of the committee? I don't want to speak out of turn without having the raw data to at least say this many look like this and this many look like that. But on average, my observation is we are receiving more names that would align better with the new policy. So yes, these are names that either reflect a more diverse Edmontonian from a background that is non-European 
or the use of flora and fauna. So we have seen a marked adjustment. Now, this is also an adjustment that administration has made when working with specifically developers and community applicants. So administration, of course, is wanting their proposed names to align with the policy. That's successful for the community, for the developer, for us as the committee, as well as for the city. So yes, generally I would say from the list of approved names from the past year, you will see quite a significant trend towards either flora, fauna, or there are a number of more culturally diverse names. That's, um, I'm happy to hear that, and certainly sounds like there's a lot of concerted efforts uh, in that area of um, diversity and inclusion. And um, yeah, because I'm, I'm noting some of the names approved this year, you know, um, uh, yeah, very, no, absolutely, I, I think I can see that, and I think it's, you're also seeing that reflected um, with among Edmontonians too, right? Um, I guess just a minor question on the budget. So the budget you have submitted is your actual, but not your, sorry, not budget, uh, not your budget for 2022, but your actual spending. Just so, so I just wanted to clarify. Uh, yes, that is correct. This would be a reflection on the expenditures from the 2022 budget. The naming committee, as it is currently structured, does not receive an allocation for programming or delivery of any particular service. I understand administration, of course, holds funds for their portion of the work and their employees, but we receive them the honorarium for those who have selected it, and then we have been meeting virtually, so our costs are quite minimal, and we can spend our time focusing more on the business of reframing naming in Edmonton than meeting and, and expending money on programs, but that is certainly something we would like an opportunity to explore in terms of the actions that will come from our recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I just wanna thank you uh, and the entire committee for your, for, for your report and for your work. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much for that presentation and for the, the information here. I'm just, um, so we are, we are steering away from, from names so that we don't sort of fall into the same, um, I guess, position that we're in now with, with names like Dan Knott and Oliver and that, is that right? That's, that is correct, policy. yes. Okay. It is uh, prioritize, reprioritization while individual names are not excluded, there is a thicker lens through which we're observing those recommendations. Okay, so if, if we're not using names, should we change your committee name? <laughs> uh, fair question. We are in fact applying a name to a resource or an asset that belongs to the city. So the function remains though the use of proper names may move forward. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I'm just wondering, so your, your, your budget or th like, there's nothing for consultation or anything, right? That's you let the city That's do correct. that. That's the city's work then. And they feed that information to you or. That's correct. I would uh, suggest uh, if Corey has additions to respond to what funding might be available for consultation specifically. Okay. Yeah, so to answer that, that question, Councillor Wright, uh, typically a lot of the consultation actually happens with, within the community level or by the applicant. There are certainly uh, administration applications um, uh, that they submit to us, and there's a lot of consultation that they do. For example, the LRT Valley Line, when they brought forward um, uh, place names, they did various consultation throughout their project. Um, or if there's a, a rec facility, there'll be consultation that administration does, but there's also a lot of consultation that the different community groups or applicants do. Um, so for example, if a developer is coming forward with wanting to name a park, they'll do a lot of the consultation with, within the neighborhood, as well as with various um, uh, organizations or those that might be uh, affected by that proposal. 
Okay, so it, it, the consultation does happen, it's just not at your level. And then that information is fed to you. Right, okay. Awesome, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you for the presentation. And, and sorry, Councilor Wright, if I can just yeah. also add that part of the work towards being much more inclusive and more diverse and holistic, that there's, uh, I would say that there's much more consultation that is being requested as well. So if there's an application that does seem a bit light, uh, the naming committee as well as um, administration will will ask the applicant or whatever group that might be to do further consultation um, or pursue uh, particular naming um, uh, in initiatives. For, uh, so if there's a facility that needs to be named and administration brings that forward, uh, for example, if we feel there's a strong Indigenous connection to that facility, we'll encourage that group to pursue that consultation and to work with those that might be impacted to do a fulsome consultation for that uh, potential naming. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'm going to add uh, one more question on the top of Councillor Wright question. I had the same question, but I could get some answer. Um, specifically, um, we mentioned consultation, like public engagement for the naming. Um, recently, uh, for our city's major infrastructure ART project, announced two new names for two stations, and also one name and for maintenance facility. However, I didn't see the consultation. And then from what I heard from Edmontonians I represent in my word, and didn't see the consultation as well. So I just wondered in the process, because the name already announced, but the consultation, we're not aware, or we missed. So do you know that? Yeah, I, I am quite familiar as I was on the committee when that happened. I am happy to respond and give you the timeline and that process. Because this is a city asset that is infrastructure built by the city, that process is administration presents an application to the naming committee on behalf of that department in this case, transportation, Gen generally with recommendations for the committee's review. What our hope is, is those names or suggestions that are given to us have gone through a consultation process. However, mm -hmm. this application and those names predate this current policy. So what you're experiencing is the outcome of the previous process wherein when administration would advise the naming committee that these were the proposed names, unless we felt strongly that they were untenable or unsupportable, that we would generally support those. Now, in terms of the Llewellyn maintenance facility, that did go through substantial communication within the city in terms of a connection to transit and the transit history of Edmonton. Through the old policy, we were looking at this through a very myopic lens where we weren't necessarily asking what the broader community would want that transit center to be called because it was a maintenance facility for the purpose of maintaining a city asset. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that today we would request that city administration have a thorough, robust con consultation with the community. Okay, thank, thank you for that answer. And then if that is the case, after the name launched, announced, if community say we're not happy for this name, so then what is the process to reframe the name? Is there an existing process already there? Or That's an excellent question as well. Councillor, the revised policy now allows for renaming. In the instance of your community and a recent name, we haven't gone through that process. We have looked at renaming assets that are problematic so far, and that's what our focus has been. 
I would suggest that that renaming process could be applied to something more recent. I would like to defer to Corey on how that might work in terms of a conversation. To add to what Chair Aaron was uh, stating, that's, that, that's the, the situation with the renamings. And right now it's kind of more designed for problematic names. In this particular case, because the facilities are still being um, developed, there's, there's certainly an opportunity for the community to raise concerns and for administration and the, the consultants working on the, the new stations and that the continuation of that line to, to revisit those names if, if there were concerns with those names or if there were um, community members who felt strongly about using a different name. Um, so since there's two station names as well as the bridge name and the facility name, we're not necessarily sure what names could be, the, uh, what, what name people have issues with, but certainly the naming committee is always willing to listen um, to those concerns, even without a formal renaming application, because as, as Aaron stated, that is more for the existing kind of problematic names. And in this case, these are still developing assets. So this, uh, this type of process will apply for general speaking for any type of name, rename process. So it's not only for specific one, and so that's my understanding. Uh, Aaron, and then if, if I can, just one okay. sentence, if I can, uh, I would like to follow up with you offline. Okay. And for my further question, so I'm not going to ask tonight. Okay, thank you. I, I would be happy to respond for any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rex. Councillor Nack, can you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. I am just curious, uh, Aaron uh, and Corey, uh, with the new policy and uh, making sure that Edmonton's current diversity, but also Edmonton's past diversity, is reflected in uh, in new names or names being changed. How do you like? How do you get the word out to the community that people can submit names? Uh, from diverse backgrounds. I'm so happy you asked that. We at the naming committee will be bringing forward a policy to action plan that includes recommendations for how we as committee members would like to engage with the community mm. to do just that, invite them to apply, invite them to participate in the process to inform and educate, of course, but also to open ourselves up to dialogue and conversation. Mm. Okay, that that's that's good because uh, you know when I look at the history of the indigenous communities on this land, right, that is not properly reflected in the in the names. Then you look at the uh, histories of some of the. Uh, cultural communities, for example, Chinese communities has long, long history in, uh, uh, in Edmonton. Uh, South Asian community has a long history in Edmonton. I only remember a couple of names uh, in, from, from that community. The Lebanese community is more than almost 150 years uh, history here, right? And, uh, and other communities as well, right? So I think, how do we reach out to them and let them know that there are opportunities for them to be putting forward names for for uh, for recognition yeah absolutely we do have some reflection of that diversity yeah. we know those people were here and they were significant members of the community we have sohan singh bulher park yes. which his story is amazing and it's only one that i've recently become familiar with myself we know that there is a lot of work to do to not only connect with communities in particular indigenous communities, it's not just about asking for a name and following a process. It's about receiving a gift of language and the trust that's engendered within that. That is part of our hope that we can undertake more of those conversations thoughtfully. Got it, thank you so much for that. And uh, uh, with that, I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. All right. Um, I'm a 
Sorry, um, I just wanted to add to what Aaron was was stating with the, the recommendations coming forward. One thing that, that's been a great help, and I do have to thank you, Mayor Sohi, as well as Councillor Tang, is that you both have um, indicated to different cultural groups within your, well, in, in Councillor Tang's um, situation, her ward, but you, Mayor Sohi, throughout the city, you folks, when you're out and having your community meetings with the different groups, you have provided that that opportunity or just sharing the, just even the awareness that these groups can reach out to us. And I've already met with four of the different groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you both have influenced those groups. So I would encourage, encourage the other councillors as well that when you do have your, your community meetings uh, within your wards, that if there's the opportunity, certainly encourage those cultural groups um, to reach out to us. And we're more than willing to help out uh, share the process um, and provide, um, you know, park sites and also uh, share the naming policy and, and help them pursue this. Because as uh, Chair Aaron has um, shared today, we really do want to um, provide the opportunity to be more diverse within the city of Edmonton. Yeah, good. that's a good suggestion for, thank you so much for that. Uh, Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I just had a, a question that sparked, I guess, um, <clears throat> based on your, your answers around the renaming. As, as you go forward with renaming, you know, I, I do, I do um, you know, recognize the importance of names in terms of creating that sense of place. So I guess maybe to you, Erin, what are you already seeing or what do you anticipate seeing in terms of, yes, while the name is problematic, some people are still attached to those names. How, how, what do you see the path forward with, with that or with any kind of sensitivity or considerations around, you know, that bringing people along on that change? It's a really tricky balance and it's certainly one of the most challenging issues as we move from individuals who we agree were egregiously flawed though perhaps of their time to people that we may disagree about i believe i spoke about this last year related to churchill emily murphy people are complex i think we have to be really respectful of hearing how people feel about these historic figures. In some cases, we know more about their public story than we do about them as individuals. Some of these names, though, were applied for lesser known, less public figures. There may be strong community connections remaining. I don't have a magic bullet, a silver bullet, moonshot, that's going to resolve every single one of those cases. I think this really is about being open to having the difficult conversation about naming. Mm -hmm. That's the part where the committee can only go so far in carrying the torch. And I really appreciate the conversation we're having here tonight tells me that you're open as councillors to talking with members and citizens about this too. But we are going to face more difficult challenges with names that not everyone agrees on. If we can find a way to commemorate, no, but not celebrate, I think there are opportunities through other systems that exist within the city, whether it's the Edmonton Heritage Council or plaques. These are other ways that we can tell stories that are difficult, but not pretend they didn't happen. Well, I love that. I love that. And I, I just have to say in my last couple of minutes, I'll just quickly speak. I, I have since becoming elected to a much more deeper appreciation for the complexity and the nuance and the, um, thoughtfulness that goes into naming and creating that tapestry that is our city and so i just i just want to say that that you know the work that you do is is sometimes you know not the the most you know 
publicized per se, but I think it's so impactful. And, and that appreciation is definitely something I'm learning every time you present to us and, and every time we think about those name changes. So thank you so much for all you and the committee have done in this area. Thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions. Uh, once uh, uh, again, thank you so much for your leadership and uh, uh, such a thoughtful approach to a very complex uh, uh, issue and uh, and uh, some of the complexities around history and all that. Right. So I uh, really appreciate how you how you navigating this. Uh, uh, this area, right? So, really appreciate that. Please do convey our uh, appreciation to the rest of the committee. Yeah, good. Thank you. With that, we are done with the questions. I want to want to move the naming uh, recommendations. Or oh, sorry, uh, Councilor Tang, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I'm. Oh, oh. oh, no, oh to speak. Oh, to speak. Okay, okay. Uh, um, please move. Sure, I am happy to move that. Uh, that this report be uh, OCC01724 be received for information. Okay. Thank you, Councillor uh, Tang. We need a seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Nack, right? Okay. Uh, to speak, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Name Committee's work first. Like Erin, you mentioned and you, the work as a name and we named for our city, for parks, for words, uh, for other LT stations or any other type of name and may not satisfy everybody. And then it's not easy work and then it's difficult and a challenge uh, specifically. And I think those challenge or disagreements with certain names uh, could resolve and through and more public consultation and with uh, engaged with the community. But I know based on what I heard tonight and it is not 100% could resolve. And uh, however, I really appreciate this conversation tonight and then to help uh, myself and even like the, I think the information you provide is a pro space in particular and for process and how we rename and how we the name comes up for those process will help um, public and help including myself to understand better and for the name community's work. I would like to say and since I uh, started campaign in 2021 um, in May, and I actually received lots of questions, and in my ward specifically, and from the residents in the ward, and to feel challenge and the difficulty to pronounce uh, the word name. Because every time when I introduce my word, I have to say my word name is the longest name, and across the entire city, and 21 letters long and eight syllables. And even though, and for myself, English as my second language, I have to practice break down the syllables for this. And also people are really interested to understand what's the meaning behind the names. Uh, I think from that public consultation or community engagement perspective, and I can say that improvement to help uh, our public understand the meaning behind the name is really important. And then otherwise, uh, it may end up, it may end up like just why we need this long name. So I think that educational piece, also community engagement piece is really important. And this is one point I would like to, another point I would like to say, uh, city is like our mayor uh, always talk about, we build a city for everyone. So city is everyone's city. And then when we provide the name to certain buildings, heritage, parks, and I think consider that the public feeling or public perception uh, 
as a city, if we could put some effort on those type of things, and then people will feel more enjoyable and to our parks and to our facilities, to our ART stations, and for the public transit systems, and make all this name is not just a name. Is what what's the meaning behind the name really impact and how we perceive our city as a home? So I just want to put uh, some comments there, and also I have other question I would like to follow up with the name committee offline and to draw some concern I heard and from world residents I represent. But I really want to take this opportunity to thank everybody's everybody's work and thank you. That's my. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Reyes. Are we ready to speak or anyone else to speak? To vote? Close? Uh, Councilor Tank to close, please. Um, yeah, I, I actually forgot to mention this, but I, I wanted this to be, sh to share this uh, in a more public way. Um, you know, yes to everything that was, uh, that came up tonight. And I just want to also uh, say how, how impressed I am with some of the, the research and tracking uh, work that, uh, Aaron, that you had mentioned. I think that's actually really important to have that kind of data. And I encourage the committee to continue doing that work and uh, even further break down if we can. So I'm really looking forward when that comes back. Uh, great work. Uh, and um, I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tank. Please vote. Councillor Stevenson, has the vote come up for you? We're still waiting on your vote. It hasn't come up, sorry, but I'm a yes. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> thank you Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes the agenda. Bylaws none, private reports none, motions pending none. Any notes of motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we are adjourned.